I'm going to continue on with our next speaker. We have Dr. Tom Hoffman, who's the project manager for the InSight Mars mission that launched in May, and is due in November of this year. He's also the former deputy project manager for the GRAIL mission that gravity mapped the moon and has worked on several flight missions for the Earth, Mars, and deep space. Please welcome Dr. Tom Hoffman. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for having me here, I appreciate it. I'm uh, very proud to be able to tell you about the InSight mission. We uh, launched on Cinco de Mayo of this year from Vandenberg Air Force Base. I don't know, did anybody happen to see the, the launch? Anybody go to the launch? Great, all right. So if you went to the launch site though, you probably didn't actually see it. You got a great launch experience, but didn't see anything. If anybody stayed here in the local area, then you were actually able to see it. Uh, it was quite spectacular over the, uh, I was told anyway, I was up at Vandenberg. It's quite, it's quite, uh, quite spectacular uh, coming down south of here. So anyway, uh, the InSight mission is a, is a pretty cool mission. It's a Mars mission, but it's a little bit more than that, and I'll be happy to tell you about it. Okay, so um, we've had several missions to Mars, and we've learned a lot about the surface, uh, but real, realistically, we've only barely scratched the surface uh, maybe a few centimeters down with the Phoenix arm. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with that, landed at the poles. Um, so we've found out a lot about the surface. We know that there's dust devils. There's some cool pictures here from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, spacecraft. Uh, we know that there's some activity at the surface. You can see we caught a, uh, happened to catch a little avalanche at one point. Um, but there's a lot of questions about how Mars formed, um, how it evolved, and kind of where it's headed. And so really, that's uh, what the InSight mission is designed to do, is to try to answer some of those questions. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to study basically how Mars formed in comparison to uh, Earth and the other rocky planets. All of the rocky planets uh, go through the same process of formation. So they start out, uh, they start accreting material, they get bigger and bigger, they heat up, and then they differentiate. So they differentiate into, from a, uh, into a a core, which is the hot mantle part. It could be solid, it could be liquid, or some combination thereof. If it's spinning, it creates a nice magnetic field. Um, then there's the mantle, which is the majority of the uh, planet. Um, and then there's the crust, and the crust is what we interact with here on Earth and on any other planet. It's, it can be kilometers thick, hundreds of kilometers thick, depending on the, the planet. Uh, but that's basically all we know about any planet from uh, seeing it. So what we have to do is actually if we want to understand more about the interior of the planet, we have to use other techniques. And the technique that's uh, most viable is seismology. So, that, uh, so we're going to use a seism seismograph to uh, understand what is going on inside the, the planet, understand how it formed, how it evolved over time, and where it might be headed. So, you know, Earth and Mars formed at about the same time, uh, obviously, about four and a half billion years ago. But they kind of took different paths. We, we have a, a great planet here, Mars, much more dry. Uh, but there's probably, in the early time periods, they were probably much more similar than they are today. And so we want to understand a little bit about what, what are the differences there? How, how did they evolve in a different way? So we're going to go to Mars, uh, do that, because we've never really done that before at any other place. We have sent uh, seismographs to the moon to understand the moon. We put, sent those on Apollo. Uh, but frankly, the moon, as you can see in this diagram, is relatively small. So it didn't go through the same processes, the same uh, geo geophysical processes that Earth and uh, Mars went through due to the size. And so it's not really a good analog. Uh, we hopefully will understand enough about Mars and how it's different than Earth, how it's similar to the Earth, that we'll all be able to take that information and actually extrapolate it to some of the hopefully exoplanets to understand which ones of those might have similar uh, characteristics to Earth or similar characteristics to Mars, which ones might be habitable, which ones might not be. So um, it's really, InSight is a Mars mission, but we're really looking at things even beyond Mars with the, the science that we're trying to do. So specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to determine what the size of the core is, uh, what it's made out of, if it's liquid or solid. If it's liquid, how much of it is it liquid? Um, we're also going to look at the thickness and the structure of the crust. So how, th how thick is that relative to the mantle and the core? Uh, what is that also made out of? And then the structure of the mantle and also what it's made out of because uh, seismic waves actually travel differently through different medium. You get enough uh, Mars quakes, or Mars quakes because we're on Mars, not earthquakes. 
Uh, you get enough Mars quakes, you can actually start to determine uh, what the structure is at a, at a basic level, what the constitution is of the different uh, portions of the uh, planet. Um, and then we'll also uh, look at how warm is the interior of the planet, how much heat is still coming out of Mars, uh, an indication of the aliveness of a, a planetary body is how much heat is still generating. The Earth is still generating lots of heat. We still have active volcanoes. Uh, we know in the past that Mars had very active volcanoes, but now it's pretty much shut down. We want to understand how shut down is it? Uh, how, how, is it how, is that, how has that changed over time? So how are we going to do that? So I'll tell you a little bit about the InSight mission timeline. So we've been, we started the mission in 2011, so we've been working on it for about seven years now. Uh, we went through a process of building up the spacecraft, to going through the test process uh, of the spacecraft with all the different uh, instruments on it. Uh, we've done that checkout, that test, uh, that's been done. Uh, then we've shipped off to Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, earlier this year uh, so that we could get ready for our launch. We did our launch on uh, May 5th of this year from Vandenberg. Uh, that was on a uh, Atlas V. So similar to the test mission, we were a relatively small spacecraft because we're about the size of the Phoenix spacecraft, which was actually designed for a Delta II, which is about half the rocket that an Atlas V is. Uh, but that's an Atlas V is what we had, so we were uh, about the same size in the fairing uh, as what you saw with TESS. In fact, probably a little bit smaller than that. Uh, but we do have a couple of other uh, people that are following, or spacecrafts that are following with us I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so right now we're in our cruise to Mars. We're about halfway there. Uh, we passed the halfway point earlier this month. And so I've been told by our navigators there's no turning back. We're definitely going to Mars at this point. Um, so. Anyway, uh, in November of this year, we'll start what we call our approach phase. So that's as we get much closer to Mars, we start doing uh, a series of trajectory correction maneuvers to more closely target exactly where it is we're trying to land on Mars. Uh, we'll do several of those over the course of that month to make sure that we're hitting exactly the, the target in the atmosphere that'll put us on the right location that we want to be on the surface. Um, and then we actually start our entry, descent, and landing phase uh, in on uh, November 26th, so that's Cyber Monday, the day after Monday after Thanksgiving. So if you're, you know, have nothing better to do while you're online shopping, uh, you know, doing that, put bring up the, the the feed in the corner of your screen, and you can watch uh, watch that landing happen. So it'll be happening about 11:47 uh, Pacific time. So a little bit before noon is when we'll actually uh, be landing. So it's kind of prime time from that standpoint. You don't have to get up in the middle of the night or anything like that, you can actually uh, just, just watch it from your computer. Um, sure, there'll be events in the local area as well, but that's still being worked out uh, in terms of what uh, public activities there'll be. But there'll certainly be lots of things uh, around the country too in terms of uh, museums and other places. So if you're interested in participating in it, you can easily find that out from uh, our website, which I'll have the link up coming up in just a little bit. So once we land, uh, we go through the EDL process. Um, we actually get to the surface. We have to go through one more process of uh, essentially of uh, entry, descent, and landing, which is uh, our instruments that we have, our seismometer uh, and our heat flow physical properties package. We actually have to lift off of the deck of the lander with a robotic arm and place them onto the surface. So that'll be the very first time that we've ever uh, done that robotically on another uh, planet. So. Uh, that's one of the challenges we've been working on and things that we've been challenged with in terms of testing and designing that process for the last several years. It's been a big focus of ours. Anytime you do a new thing, it's, it takes a lot of extra effort. Um, so that's the kind of the, the quick synopsis. So we did uh, go through, as I mentioned, the spacecraft assembly and test, otherwise known as the ATLO process. You can see off on the left side there is the, the uh, what we look like in our cruise configuration. So being dropped down there is the cruise stage with the solar rays on it. And then underneath that is the aero shell. That's the uh, part that protects our lander uh, while we're in transit to Mars. And then it helps us get through the atmosphere successfully. So before we actually start the entry into the atmosphere, we actually throw off the cruise stage and it'll kind of come off just the way it's shown there coming on. It'll just get tossed. And then we'll start the, the process of going through EDL. Uh, off on the right, you can see the robotic arm, the white object there, is picking up and placing our seismometer. So that's a process we've practiced several times in ATLO. We actually have a test bed at JPL, which we have a, an EM, electron, uh, engineering version of the arm, 
uh, with a full mock-up of the lander. We have uh, Mars weight uh, instruments, and we practice uh, placing these all the time. One of the things that we have to do, as soon as we land, uh, we're trying to land at a place that's very flat uh, with uh, low rocks, uh, kind of like a parking lot in Kansas for a Walmart is what we're looking for. Uh, dull, flat, and boring. Sorry if there's somebody from Kansas. I'll, you can pretend I said Nebraska or something else. Uh, but in any case, that's where we're trying to, we're trying to land, a uh, place like that. Uh, but still, what we need to do when we first land is we actually need to go through and take a picture, uh, several pictures of what the surface looks like directly in front of us. We op obviously have limited ability of where we can place uh, these instruments because of the reach of the arm. It, it is about uh, six feet long, so it is pretty good reach, but still that limits where we can put uh, the two different instruments that we need to place it. So we need to go through a process of checking to make sure that we understand where we're going to put it, and then we're going to practice that in the test bed here uh, on Earth. We'll have Mars formed it, so the test bed will look, uh, maybe not in color-wise, but it'll look in terms of the terrain, uh, slopes, rocks. We're going to recreate that at JPL uh, in our test bed, practice a couple times before we actually put it down uh, for good on, on Mars. Uh, we actually can pick it up and move it. People always ask that if we need to, but we really don't want to have to move it if we put it in the place we didn't want to. So one of the uh, other th cool things that we did on this is we included a chip uh, that people were uh, put, could put their names in. Did anybody put their names in on Insight? All right, cool. Oh, awesome. I should have known that there would be a lot in this crowd. But uh, that's great. So you guys are going to be at least virtually on Mars with us when we land, which is super cool along with about 2.4 million other people. So we had a great turnout in terms of the number of names we have. Uh, that's myself and the principal investigator, Bruce Bannert, there with, we also got a, you got a boarding pass if you filled that out. That's us with our boarding passes uh, when the chips were getting installed at Lockheed Martin Clean Room. So they got, there's two very small chips uh, with engraved all the different names on there. And if you missed your opportunity or you want to do it again, uh, Mars 2020 will be doing a similar thing probably fairly soon. I don't know exactly when, uh, but if you go look at the, the Mars website at JPL, uh, you'll be able to figure out when that's happening and uh, get another chance to get yourself on Mars somewhere else. So we did get a launch. Um, you can see in the bottom left there is a picture of what it looked like uh, as we rolled back the tower for the Atlas V at Vandenberg Air Force Base. This was the very first planetary launch from California, so I've been to a lot of launches. I've had the, the privilege of, of seeing a lot of launches, but mostly all from uh, the East Coast. Certainly all the planetary ones previously were from the East Coast. So at being a native California, I was very excited to be able to be the very first planetary launch from California. Uh, you can kind of see in that picture where we're, we're rolling back the tower, it looks a little bit foggy, the lights are a little blurry and everything, and that was about as good as it got, frankly. It got just worse and worse and worse. We did launch uh, at 4.05 a.m., so we got off in the very first uh, second of our very first win uh, day of the launch period, which was great. Uh, if you were in Santa Barbara, you would have seen in a, on a mountain above the clouds, you can see the fog and clouds there, you would have seen the middle picture, which was quite spectacular. This was, uh, both of these pictures were sent by amateur Photographers, I got a lot of really cool pictures sent to me, which was neat. So you can see it lifting up there out of the clouds. And then uh, if you're in the LA Basin, I think this was from the Santa Monica Mountains, but I'm not 100% sure you got to see the nice trail. It's a time lapse, obviously. Uh, nice trail of the spacecraft as it launched and headed south. Uh, people often ask, why is it that we could launch from California as opposed to the East Coast? Um, generally, you get a little bit more kick when you're closer to the equator. So uh, the KSC is closer than Quater, obviously, than uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. The reason is largely because we were a small payload on a large rocket. And so what we were able to do is get enough oomph from that rocket uh, to actually launch. So we did come south, and then we came back around the, the North Pole. We took a left turn and went to Mars. So that's how we did it. <laughs> it's all about just a left turn. Uh, we actually have two other spacecraft that are traveling with us uh, to Mars. Uh, you might have heard about the Mars Cube 1 spacecraft. Um, so these are designed, these are CubeSats. They're, they're uh, like 6U CubeSats. Uh, they're very first time we've tried to do a deep space uh, CubeSat. They're both still operating well and, and tracking us. I call them, sometimes I call them our stalkers because they're stalking us, taking pictures. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, what they're designed to do, though, is augment our communications for the period of time in which we're doing our entry, descent, and landing. 
Um, so during that time period, we don't have uh, as good a favorable uh, coverage uh, from the orbital assets that we've had in previous landings, like with uh, Curiosity Landing or even the Spirit and Opportunity Landings. Uh, they had great coverage from Odyssey. Uh, Odyssey is in a different configuration and it's kind of towards the end of its life, so we didn't want to spend a lot of fuel to try to get it into a configuration where it could see us during our, our entry, descent, and landing period. Uh, MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, will be able to see us, uh, but their communications process is such that they'll record the data and then several hours later send it back uh, to Earth. Um, so we actually decided to send uh, Marco uh, with us uh, to track us and to also provide real-time uh, feedback on the communication. So if they make it all the way to Mars with us and it's looking good so far, uh, and they operate correctly, they'll actually be sending back the very first sets of data that we have indicating that not only was the EDL uh, successful, but we also will give us telemetry on what happened and some indication of how we're looking on the surface in the first few minutes at least. So that's, uh, that's a, an important technology that we're demonstrating. Um, so we are going to land uh, Elysium Planitia. Uh, it's near the equator. We are 100% solar power, so you heard in the previous talk there are limitations of solar power. Uh, one of ours is that we have to be about five degrees north or south of the equator to last a full Mars year uh, with 100% solar power. And we are very much oversized in the terms of our uh, energy that we're generating from the rays because we do have to account for uh, dust accumulation over the course of a Mars year. We're going to get a lot of dust on those rays. And we have to account for the fact there's a dust storm. Uh, it's, there are dust storms on Mars. There was a huge one. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Just recently, it's been abating, but it's still dust storm season on Mars right now. So there's a chance that we'll get another dust storm. We, we are designed to survive uh, a very large uh, scale dust storms. Um, but you can see we're actually fairly close to Curiosity, which is still active. Uh, that creates some interesting uh, problems for the orbital assets because they're going to be trying to track, uh, get data from both Curiosity and us, but we worked out a way to do that. We're lucky now that we have about four different satellites at Mars that can get data back uh, from the surface to the, spa to the spacecraft that are orbiting and then down to Earth. So we have lots of, uh, lots of those uh, available. You can see I put also the other locations that we've landed on Mars just as a reference here. Uh, Phoenix was the one that was up at the poles. Uh, we're using a very similar design of the flight system in terms of the structure. Uh, the, the solar rays are larger, but they're very similar technology uh, for Phoenix. Uh, we have a different arm because Phoenix was designed to kind of dig into the, the regolith. Our, our arm is designed to lift. So we're actually reusing an arm from a, a 2001 mission that didn't actually launch. So we're reusing that flight arm uh, as one way to keep our cost down. Uh, so when we do do our entry, descent, and landing, I'll show a quick video here in a second. Uh, but what will happen is it's a, there's about three, there's three ways that you can basically land on Mars. Uh, we're using a, a technique much like Viking did. So we start out with a, a heat shield that starts to hit the friction in the atmosphere. It heats up. That friction starts to slow uh, the vehicle down. We start out at about 12,500 miles per hour when we hit the upper atmosphere. Uh, we go on the heat, the heat shield slows us down. Uh, then we throw out the parachute. Uh, it's su still, we're still supersonic. That parachute we're on for about a minute, a couple minutes. Uh, that'll get us down to about 130 miles per hour. Uh, we drop off the heat shield while we're on the, the parachute. Uh, once we're down to about 130 miles per hour, we actually will drop the lander out of the aeroshell. It'll free fall for a couple of seconds, which is absolutely terrifying as a project manager. Uh, before the retro rockets fire, those retro rockets will fire, drop us down uh, to the rest of the way to the surface, and when we hit the surface, we're going about five uh, miles per hour. We have some shock absorbing legs uh, that'll take up the rest of that energy and hopefully put us very safely onto the, the surface. We do do a rotation as, we, as we're landing to make sure that we're facing, uh, the, the instrument area is facing south because we don't want shading. So if we're, we're gonna be about five degrees north, so that gives us a nice uh, area out in front of the lander. Uh, which will not get shaded as once we put the instruments down there. Um, so let's run this real quick. That's going to go through EDL much faster than it really occurs. So this is about, you've heard the seven minutes of terror. We're actually about six and a half minutes, so it's not quite as scary for quite as long, but it's going to seem like an eternity nonetheless. Uh, so you can see the parachutes come out uh, a little bit smaller than the, the uh, Curiosity parachutes. 
Uh, we dropped the heat shield there that's protected us while we were in the upper atmosphere. The legs, the legs spring out. Uh, then we drop the uh, lander itself. It free falls for a little bit. Terrifying. And then it starts firing. The, the retro rockets gets us down to the ground. Not really shown here, but we do do a small maneuver, as I said, to get us so that we're facing uh, due south. Uh, then w once we're on the ground, you can see there's no solar rays yet. We actually have to open the solar rays. They open up basically like a fan on each side, and they're about the same size as the, the actual lander itself. Um, so we have uh, two main instruments on there. We have a seismometer that's going to, you know, probe into the deep interior. We also have a heat flow physical properties package, uh, which will actually has a, a self-hammering nail, essentially, that'll go about uh, 15 feet into the Mars regolith. It'll be measuring how much heat is still coming out of the planet so we can get, again, an idea of how alive the planet still is in terms of its uh, interior heating capability. Uh, interestingly, we also have several other instruments on there. Uh, we have a, a pressure sensor, we have wind sensors, we have a magnetometer for the very first time uh, available on the surface. Uh, those are essentially a weather station, so it's going to be very cool for us to understand uh, what the weather is for a full Mars year, at least one location on Mars. Um, but they're really there to help the seismometer instrument. It's, the seismometer is great at detecting everything, including all kinds of environmental noise, so that gives us the ability to take that environmental noise out of the, uh, the measurement that we're getting. So I mentioned that we have, uh, once we land, we have to go through the process of deploying robotically these instruments. Um, that process is going to take us about uh, 46 sols uh, on, on Mars. So it's, it, it takes a while for us to characterize first the lander, make sure it's healthy once it lands, that we understand how much, uh, how much temperature control it still has, how much power it's generating. Then we have to characterize the environment where we want to put these instruments. Then we have to go through the process of placing them. And before we do that, we want to test it out because we really uh, don't want to put it in a bad place and then not be able to grapple it again. Um, so that process will take us a, a little bit of time. And this is a very sped up version of what that 46 days is. Presuming we've already characterized the area. You can see it's got some rocks in here. This is probably very close to what we'll we expect we might see in a, in a kind of a bad case scenario. Uh, we're expecting less than 10% rocks in, in the area that we land. Uh, I've been guaranteed that by our landing site person, Matt Gollenbeck. <laughs> uh, so we actually, I didn't mention it, but we have this wind and thermal shield that's being placed over there now. Uh, most of the time, seismometers on Earth are placed deep in vaults, um, and then they're climate controlled, temperature controlled. Uh, pressure controlled and so that they don't have any of those bad negative environmental influences. Obviously, we're on the surface of Mars. It's windy, it's dusty. Uh, temperature changes dramatically during the course of the day. So we try to compensate for that at least partially with this wind and thermal shield that we push, put over it, which includes layers of Kapton tape and like essentially like medieval chain mail to make sure if there's rocks, it'll flow over those rocks. Uh, then once we're on the surface there, we go for uh, a full Mars year collecting uh, data. Uh, we have to go through one more phase with the heat flow physical properties package of actually the penetration. Uh, that'll take probably another uh, two months because we stop every so often and characterize the soil and continue down. So that is uh, just about the end, but you can follow along with us. We're posting a lot of stuff uh, on the website. If you're a Facebook or Twitter person, you can see uh, what we're doing there as well. So I think I'm I think I've hit my time limit, so there might be time for a couple more questions, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last evening we were speaking about water or ice near the surface, and you have this fabulous nail. Uh, is that available for reuse as an ice finder? Uh, it, 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 I guess potentially you could do that. It was, it's designed really for temperature uh, monitoring because what it does is it pulls down behind it a bunch of temperature uh, gauges. Uh, but it is a way to penetrate into the regolith. I guess the technology could be reused for something like that. Of course, where we're landing, we're expecting it to be incredibly dry. That's one of the, one of the criteria we actually had for, for using it. Yes? Given um, the, sorry. Oh. Given the difficulties we've heard about with uh, solar power on Mars, is there a reason why you don't use RTGs? 
Uh, they're not really available for us, frankly. They're not, it's, it was not an option for us in, in this, on this particular mission. I've, I have worked other missions where we used R RTGs, but for this mission, it wasn't available. And frankly, it probably would have created some interference with our seismometer. Again, it's like incredibly sensitive. Um, literally, if there was a butterfly on Mars and it landed on the seismometer, it would be able to detect that. It's, it can measure deflections in the Mars surface of like one half the bore radius of a hydrogen atom. So it's incredibly sensitive. And magnetic, magnetic fields or radiation fields would, would also interfere with it, so. Yes. Hi, in all this fabulous audio uh, data, are you gonna be able to give us what it would actually sound like if we were standing on Mars? Oh, I, I, I don't know. That's please, why we should please, go there. Please find out how to do that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what kind of picture does that size monitor, size monitor give, give of the whole planet? Does it give you a 3D picture of everything or what? Yeah, it'll essentially, it'll give you, it'll, it'll, it'll create a 3D vision of what the interior of Mars looks like. So it, it's going to take several different Mars quakes over the course of that Mars year because we don't know how active... Uh, active Mar uh, Mars is. We know it doesn't have tectonic plates, but we have a lot of evidence of, of Mars quakes exist, and, and they should from, from uh, models that we've done of Earth and the Moon. Plus, we have meteorite impacts constantly, and we can detect those as well. So all those signals over time will actually be able to create like a, almost like an ultrasonic view of what Mars looks like inside. Two weeks ago, I met several of your colleagues at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, oh, yeah. and yep. that, that was a fabulous tour. I got so much information on it. It's very cool, and for all of you in the crowd, please uh, check that out and see if they're coming to your hometown. Yeah, we're actually out in Barstow this weekend. Okay. So yeah. if you have any friends in Barstow, tell them to come by. We're, we're, we have been doing a cool thing I didn't mention because it's close to being done, but we did do a road show before launch. We're going to continue that for just a little bit longer, and then we're hoping that we're going to have a bunch of stuff right around landing and then after landing to continue that, but that's still like in the planning stages. If there are underground lakes of liquid water, would your seismometer be able to detect and differentiate those if they're large enough? That's a great question, and I, I actually am not sure if we would. It kind of depends. It depends on how the uh, how we get those Mars quakes in. It would probably... I would say probably not, but I wouldn't say absolutely not. We, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I actually need to go back and talk to our, our science guys about that. All right, thank you.